Like when they organized. Yeah, that, 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 that's it. What, are you rewinding it? No, I'm recording. Oh, you are. Okay. Okay. You know, is it possible for me to turn yeah, this just, off? Just Would you mind if I turn this off? Hit yourself. Just like this? Yeah. That's all it is. at one time. It stopped it. Okay, you were saying, why the difference between Georgia and Alabama? Well, the South would organize practically my near, back in the 30s and 40s. But so many people got to beat off of it, you know. If you, you can't touch them Georgia people. I don't know where we even got one, one mill. No, I don't think it's in Georgia. Opelika down here now. It's the only mill that we got organized. One is seal crest, a field crest, in, field crest. Uh, across in Columbus. In the yeah, yeah, well, that's right across the, that's the right. Phoenix City. Yeah, very few. I know Jake Matthews is supposed to be working them two mill. You know him? I don't know. Jake Matthews, he's the organizer. Yeah. And he was working them two mills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There. But in North Georgia, we had Tryon, not Tryon, but Dalton. Mm -hmm. That mill up there, Dalton organized. Mm -hmm. It stayed organized until it went down. And it closed up. Now, what's the situation with the mill here now? We get the shopping center up here now. Uh -huh. The new shopping center is where the old mill used to sit. It's all gone. Well, you were here when the yeah. old mill was there, wasn't you? Yeah. You, 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 didn't, you didn't pay no attention to it? No. They put up a dry uh, candy bird station in the, the mill, I mean, uh, stored up there in place of it. Hmm. And so they, they made a big lot out of that. They covered over them two lakes. Mm -hmm. You know, the lake was still there when you were here. Mm -hmm. They covered them lakes over, took the field dirt, hauled it in, and they made a big shopping center up here. They called it Kennebury Station Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. hey, you know, Kennebury used to be the heart of gas, I mean, out of them city. I remember back when I was a kid, not nothing on Wall Street. Two or three old buildings up there. And all the business down in Canterbury. We had the old liver stables, I can remember all that. Liver stables, stuff like that. So. Uh, now, tell us about when you first worked in the mill. I went to work in the mill when I was 14 year old, 19 and 26. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in the mill up there till in the 30s. It got so darn rough and everything. And I got mad quit. Well, I went up here to Alvaville and tried that. I couldn't do air work up there. It was too fine. All silk. So I come back and it was rehired. And I went back to work in 33. And I stayed in the mill until, until it went down. In 1955, I believe it was. Sorry. Yeah. And then the uh, 80 went down. I stayed on with the union here till. We give, give up all the money we, that we had, you know, took out, all the other people. Give out groceries till the money run out. And then I went to work with the Textile Workers Union. Mm -hmm. Mike Motella, you remember him? I don't remember. Well, Mike Motella was working out of a liner, so I went to work with him and got my first assignment was in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. This was uh, after in the in the 50s? No, in the 60s. In I the went 60s. to the yeah. Oh, 60s, yeah. Yeah, I just, Mill didn't go down to pitch somebody, and I mm -hmm. stayed around, drove them unemployed out here, yeah. and stayed with the union until they, we finally closed the building up. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work with the union in 60. Well, now, would you just tell us, just briefly, how you, why and how you, you formed the union here? It was a bunch of us old timers. We knew what the union was, and we wanted to organize the plant. That's the beginning of the organization. Mm -hmm. At that time, you mentioned union to anybody, you, you, they'd run your whole family out of the mill village. They'd throw your stuff out on the darn street because we had it done to us. We met up here in the woods. There was some even a lot of fire. We stayed up there in, in the dark, and we finally got an organization coming. Then we commenced contacting the people throughout the mill. And we nearly had them ready, and then the AFL stepped in and took it over then. And we were named then Dixie Federation of Labor. You got the charter on it. 
It was called the Dixie Federation of Labor. And Ailey took it over by, as I said, a fellow by the name of Cox and Dean. I, I don't remember you, I don't guess you know him. I, I know, just know the names. I've seen Cox them and Dean, yeah. yeah. Cox and Dean come in to help us. Yeah. We picked it that thing day and night, 24 hours a day, every day in the week. Nobody went in there and nobody come out. We had a complete shutdown here. And when we got some, uh, they didn't give us no groceries. We finally went to the welfare and they gave us some groceries. And uh, when they gave us some groceries, well, then we could make it all right. And then they had we board to go back to work. Or well, Cox and Dean come down there and made us beach down there. Said to strike it over, said get back to work, get them back any way you can get back. Said we're through here. And they walked out and left us. I mean just left us like a bunch of tree dogs. We had to go up there and line up to go in the employment office to see if they wanted us. He'd throw them out, you can get out, you're not here. Go, go. They threw me out of the way the first time. I went back up there the second time and they finally took me in. But they gave me to understand if it's a union formed anymore, you're a person that's going. Now, how did they give you that understanding? They just told you flat told footed, you, yes, sir. Them. They told you flat footed. They hated the union. All companies did. And then they had, we got back in there and got to working. Me and Walter Pierce. And uh, old man Lofton and a few of the old timers there got together and we commenced, and commenced forming a new union. And we commenced making wide open meetings. We held meetings. We had uh, our secretary at that time, I believe her name was Pearl Bailey. Bailey. She was secretary, record secretary. And Walter was president, and I was vice president at that time. So we finally come in, got these people organized, and then the international sent in some people and helped us finish it on out. This we, was what year then? 1942 or 43, I believe it was. Okay. I believe it was 42 or 43. During the war then? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then we commenced to meet by the company, and we got our first contract. I believe it was forty-five. It was right ahead. Had a, what had there been changes in the company that would no, have made the, that easier? No, they, no. They, we we were working at that time on the Dwight Manufacturing Company, but later after that incident took place, then Dwight sold out. Mm -hmm. And they moved their men back to Chicopee, Massachusetts. And the cones from North Carolina come in and took it over. When did the cones take it over, Tom? No, I believe it was 19 and 50, 53 or 54, something like yeah, that. Yeah, okay. And all. But I know the first strike, I mean, the first thing we had with when the cone come over was a strike. Mm -hmm. And it lasted, uh, 17 weeks, not 17 weeks, you know. But that time, we went under George Baldans in there and Amel Reeve and all. So we set up our own grocery store. We oh, bought the meat, everything we see. for the 50s, right? Yeah. And we, we set up meat and mm -hmm. all our people got anything in the world they got. They got their potatoes, their eggs, flour, lard, sugar, meat, everything, white meat. We didn't give them no ham, but it wasn't why we'd throw in a piece of ham, you know, pure ham. Yeah. And we toughed it out and we run a contact back. And went settled it with a raise and all. So the last time we come out, we went to negotiate the contract and we couldn't get nowhere with them. They had their mind made up what they're going to do. So the people wanted, wanted to stay on the strike, and we called the uh, international help 
they sent in some people to help us on it. Hey, they come in, come out to help in George Boyd Anzi. Came in. He got with this old Jew that run the old cotton mill over here, Tyler Cons. Mm -hmm. Through Cons, George worked through him because he was a Jew. And I believe George was a Jew. He got some meeting and we got into the contract negotiation again. So when we got it all settled, why well, we went and told the people that the company was willing to rig us two cents. We said our mind we want seven. Seven or nothing. So we go back, back and forth, back and forth. Trying to please the people because we we would with them. We we told them we'd get what they could get or else. So when the last time we had to meet with the company, they had told us that's it. So you go back and tell your people what it will over. If you don't like it, you know what you get. So we went and called a meeting down here on Wall Street, still working all. Had all of our people there. Me and Milton Hall got up and explained it to the people just exactly what you're facing now. If you force yourself to stay out, that company will shut it down. We were told. People didn't believe it. We plead with them people to give us a change, you know, to see if we couldn't do better next year. No, sir, we want seven cents now or else. So we said, all right. That's all you got to say. The only thing we can do is go back up there and say, tell them. We went back up there and told the company, and they give us a raise. They sent out and got all the hip in to start up the machine and everything. And then on Monday morning, when people come out going in, they took up their cards, pulling them out, and send them back home. They shut the darn mill down. They told us what they're going to do, and we told the people what they're going to do, but they wouldn't believe us. They said it's seven or nothing. Well, they give us a raise, but they shut the plant down. Let's go back now to to 1933. You were working in the mills, and what were you making then? In 1933? Yeah, this is before the NRA. Oh, well, let's see, now, when I went to work up in the mill, well, I'll start back to first, maybe I can work it up. But right. I went to work for seven dollars and a quarter a week, 44 hours, seven and a quarter a week. You're working only 44 hours? 40, well, you see, now, we went in at nine o'clock in the morning, you know. Mm -hmm. The law said you can't work, child. Oh, I see. That's right. You're, you know, they had a government or they couldn't work right. a child under 14, over, not that they is over 14, but eight hours all they yeah. let you work. Okay. So we had what we called the nine o'clock crew. Yeah, crew. We'd go in up there and if they had anything for us to do, we did. If it didn't, they sent us home. Mm -hmm. And then when I turned 16, I went on the night shift mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. And I stayed on the night shift till... I got to change for the first. But 19 and 28, 27, 28, you know, thing come is picking up, business is picking up. And I got to where I was making more money up in the cotton mill than the rubber workers made over there. Hmm. You're making how much? They were making $14 a week. Uh -huh. You were making more? Money. I was making about $16 a week up here. And all of our boys wanted to quit here and go yeah. over there. <laughs> I didn't. I stayed yeah. on up here. Should have went on where I would have, but yeah. see what the difference is. Yeah. But I what would you me losing two dollars a week? So I just stayed on with them up here until. You're working how many hours then? Working twelve hours a night, hours, eleven yeah. hours, forty-five yeah. minutes. We yeah. got fifteen yeah. minutes for supper. Yeah. That was in the thirties. Yeah. And th then you, then you, but. Uh, did you make that right up to the time when the NRA started? Well, the first, first 25 cents an hour, yeah. no, we didn't get that 25 cents an hour until yeah. the eight hour law was passed. Uh, what were you doing in the mill? I was a dolphin in the spinning room. Yeah. Dolphin in the spinning yeah. room. So you were making, uh, when the NRA came in, there, suddenly it was cut to. Oh, yeah, I worked up here during the early part of the yeah. war for less than 20 cents an hour. 
back in the early 40s, early yes, 40s. So once that, once once the, that went in, we yeah. raised every one of $12 a week. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Once the act went in, you made $12 a week. Yeah, $12 yeah. a week for 40 hours. Everybody made $12, that's yeah. it. Boyd had made 15 Yeah. Yeah. That stayed in effect until we got a chance to go to Washington. I'm proud I did. But I got to go up there and blow my horn them senators and congressmen for the 75 cent medium wage bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that way you went from 25 to 75. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a second. I think we're talking about two different years. Oh, well, sure. He, he said he made, uh, in, 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 when the NRA came in, he made 25 cents an hour. And then no, he's, he's talking about World War II. Well, then he, after that, they, he went down to 20 cents an hour. No, I was making less than 20 cents an hour. I worked up here to be 11 hours, 45 minutes a night for, I mean, the boss pushing you mm -hmm. for eight and nine dollars a week. Mm -hmm. What year was that? That's back in the 30s. No, okay. That was before it. Before NRA went in effect. That's right. That's right. Then the NRA came in, they Come in effect, effect when the law forced them to pay it $12 a week, 40 hours. Saying that, that, that everybody got. Everybody right. got to twelve dollars. Noon fixtures and everybody. Huh? Yep. See, that was the thing that made everybody so mad. Right. Yeah. And they said you had a right to form a union. Yeah. And is that did that help you to form? Well, a union? when Franklin D. Gave, gave us the right to change, he said you have a right to organize your own union, mm -hmm. and we we went to work on it. Mm -hmm. Now, what did that feel like to uh, stop working twelve hours and work eight hours? Oh, yeah, like taking a vacation. Yeah. Hey, we went on this, hey, we got into this 75 cent hour wage. He's jumping now. What do you want me to go back to? Yeah, you're just talking about the 32, 33. 33. Yeah. Well, when the first 25 cent an hour went into effect, we all went to $12. Yeah. And we stayed at that until we had raised 75 cents an hour. And they had that, we got a union and uh, we negotiated yeah, but, but weren't, uh, after the 30, uh, 34 strike, what, what was the basis for the 34 strike, do you think? Why did you come out? They was treating us as like dogs. Okay. So, was it a stretch out? Or? Stretch out mm -hmm. and everything. It wasn't, they, they weren't laying off nobody, but see, we were working with the old machinery up there. Mm -hmm. It real old. I some of the machines are set in. Mm -hmm. As I said, at that time, this mill was driven by two big steam engines. Mm -hmm. They had rope, rope from the engine room and up and cable off on every one of the floors. When one of the machines went down, they shut the whole plant down at the end. Mm -hmm. And the other side had another well, engine up there, Fred. And then they come and modernize it and put electric motors in for everything. Now, uh, when did the stretch out start? Uh, started either, either we got our raise. Mm -hmm. I mean, not our raise, when we, when I had the, it back in the early part of the 30s, mm -hmm. yeah. when the strike out, I mean, the stretch out began. Yeah, okay. He come in and out people, eliminating people in. Yeah. As I told you to start with, at that time, I mean, was employed over 3,000. Mm -hmm. And they finally, when it went down, it only worked at 1,700 up here. Now, and when you went back in, uh, did they start discriminating against people who'd been in the union? When, you know, on the first track? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yes. Let's look at this. We've got documents now from 3034. This is a deposition made out by a fellow whom you probably remember, Albert W. Cox. Who? Albert W. Cox. Albert Cox. I know it, but I... I, I Isn't I, that the Cox who was the organizer? Cox and Dean? Cox and Dean, yeah, that was the right. organizer. So was, that, was Cox's first name to Albert? I don't remember yeah. his first name, uh, but it was a Cox and Dean. Okay, now he, he is, this is on uh, November the 6th, uh, 1934, after the strike. Yeah. He's saying that he's summarizing a hearing which went on for eight days. 
There was a hearing that went here for eight days. Do you remember that? And he was saying that uh, that he's doing it for the union, which doesn't have the money to hire a bunch of lawyers like the attorneys. We're not able to employ a whole group of attorneys as are done by the Dwight Corporation. So he's having to draw this up himself. And he's dividing it into people who, uh, see, uh, See, he got a, is Moselle Snyder. Moran, remember her well? Is she still around? No, she did. Okay. What he says about her is that applied for her job on two different occasions, told both times by Mr. Parsons. That's Felix Parsons. He was a personnel manager. Employed a employment agent for the Dwight Life, uh, Manufacturing Company that they would, quote, would send for her when she was needed, unquote. Her employee, her, uh, the new employee is now in her job. What did she do during, what, did, what part did she have in your union? She went in when Cox and Dean took over. See, when Cox and Dean took over, me and Milton Hall, and all of us old fellow, we stood back. And we had got them organized, having a meeting right down here in Canterbury. Then Cox and Dean come in mm -hmm. and took over. And so we just pushed it, we just pushed ourselves out. Okay, now what it says. Do you yeah. think, since this is afterwards. Yeah, well, but he never told us much about the early, his early organizing process, and it seems like it's a really okay, important all right. thing. Let's go back to that. Yeah, then. I think it's important. Uh, could you describe again your early organizing, why you went out in the woods and so forth? Well, yeah, I can remember some of them, not all of them. Mm -hmm. And myself, Walter Pearson, and uh, Mr. Lofton, and... Uh, well, uh, the other fellows are dead now. You couldn't have done nothing about it. Mm -hmm. But it's a very small group we had to start with. And then we come back and we've done most of the organization by mouth. I talk person, they talk person on out, mm -hmm. pass it around. And so, you mentioned being out in the woods, that you, with the, you said you were in the woods without a fire. Yes, Did, sir. Yes, could sir. you describe that? Well, we met up here, go down here to... The old, well, the old mill down there's up here on Black Creek, back up there in the holler, mm -hmm. after dark, and we would dare some light of light up. There wasn't too many of them that went up there with us, but we went up there and we sat down and planned what we wanted to do. Because at that time, you said Union, it's just like I said, they just throwed every one of your folk from out of this mill village. That's how much power, because they set them out here in this mill village. Well, now, where did you get the idea to form a Union? Me and Walter Pearson and uh, all the bunch of the old boys, we got together and we decided we wanted a union. And we come and talking to the people throughout the mill. It's all by mouth, not by now, order. With your parents, with your daddy and mother, union people? My father wasn't, he wasn't working at that time. Yeah, he was working, no, no, he wasn't, he wasn't working at that time. I had a brother. Two brothers in there, he went through there. One of them went through the organization with us, and the other one, he went to work, and he got old enough to go to work. But, uh, Was there any history of unionism in your family or the community? I was born with union in my mind. That's what I want to yeah. get now. You were born with union in your mind. Yes. Where did it come from? It come from my father's side of the boat. Okay, that's okay. Out of, out of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. What were they doing that put union in their minds then? They were the, what they call a farmer's union organization. Farmer's union. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what I was wondering. That goes way back. Yeah, yeah. That's where Cox come in. Mm -hmm. And I was one of them hot heads. I believed in it. Mm -hmm. Always believe in it. Did, did you think of yourselves then as a hot head? Well, everybody else did. <laughs> 
So you were one of the founding members of the Dixie Federation. I'm on the chartered, one of the chartered members of the Dixie Federation of Labor. And and what was it that you all? I mean, how was your? How was this? This was a local group. You decided on the name. You weren't part we, of. We 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 done the organization ourselves. We wrote our own con. I mean, our own bylaws and everything to make an organization of it, where we could get it on record. Once we got it on record, then the company they didn't they didn't come at us so bad. So once you got it on record, did it become public knowledge? Sure, it come public knowledge. You got the copy over the courthouse right. with it. We wrote it out. Did you give a copy to the to the mill? No, not no. at that time. No. But they knew about it. Well, they knew about it. Sure, they knew about it, but it's there some. Mm -hmm. Now, we had the meeting right down here in Canterbury over. I'm old two-story building hanging up down at Canterbury. That's where we had our meetings at mm -hmm. back in the day. What were your meetings like? We have a full house there every time, but anywhere from 200, 300 people come to the meeting. And they come and they know not to mess with us. But now you're speaking about Cox and Dean. Now I'm going to tell you, he told a bare-faced lie. Cox and Dean was very, very rarely seen around this town. Only when you come in for something. Mm -hmm. We'd done the picking in. Mm -hmm. We stayed on the line day and night. My wife lied a lot right along the side of me and all. Our wives and everybody else. And I had a Cox and Dean so they couldn't negotiate a contract with a company. He went right down here behind this building, this brick building down here in Kennybury, and stood up on the top of the toilet, said, well, strike it over. We want to know why. Said, we can't do nothing with them. So the best thing you can do is get up there and try to get your job back. That's what Cox and Dean told us. Mm -hmm. And he left town and never did show up no more. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we had to line up like dog and cats. Well, now here is uh, Cox is is taking some kind of action to try to get these people's job back in front of this government board. The government board would never called in. The only government board that had been in, we brought them in ourselves, the AFL. I mean, the CIO brought them in. Yeah, well, that was, that was, this was, but this was in, in uh, November. Well, they, you know, back, back in time, they had to write a lie up, they had to. Yeah, I see. Uh -huh. And I said to you, I'm telling you the truth. A Cox and Dean got up right down there and told us people, the strike's over. Mm -hmm. yep. We've done all we can do for you. Now you get up there and get your job and get it the best way you can get it. And the identical words they told us. Well, now here they are uh, drawing up this thing to try to get these people's jobs back. According to this document they, they wrote, uh, I've got, they've got listed, oh, maybe 50 people that they have name a case name. for. Okay. One of them is, uh, you talk about Moselle Snyder. Yeah, I remember knowing Moselle. Uh, they said the only reason she got fired was because her father being president of the local union. Holland? Who, she's a member of the Holland family. Moselle? Her father was what? Uh, she's a member of the Holland family. I know Moselle, that was her name, Holland, yeah, yeah. 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 Moselle Snyder. But well, she, she, was, married, she, was a, she married Horace Snyder. Yeah, I remember right. that. Yeah, okay. And they said the only reason she got fired was because her father was president of the local union. If he would, I never did to him. I see. Okay. Now, the next one is Joe Hale. Joe Hale, loudmouth Joe Hale, yes, sir. Yeah. They barred him. They, they said, completely barred him. They said he was also served with an eviction notice. He run him out of town. Yeah. Okay. Did you see that? Yes, sir. I've seen it. Could you uh -huh. describe that to us? It was right up here on uh, uh, Summerworth, Morton. He was thrown out of the house right up here on Morton Avenue. Does the house still stand? Oh yeah, the little bit of three room house. Yeah. You you don't know the mill gonna do you? I we just driven around it, but didn't know it. Okay. Well, if you, I tell you how you get up there to the houses. The next one is Addie Stores, uh, Stores, S T O W E R S. Stores. Yeah, Addie Stores. Addie Stores. Uh, she's worked in the mill for forty years. 
as I said. When the strike called off, she applied as the others for her job and was not re-employed. And the next one is Ethel Burkett. B-U-R-K-E-T-T. Burkett. -T. Burkett. Uh, she worked for seven years at Dwight Plant. When she became a member of the union, her foreman came to her and in, in a sarcastic term spoke his op opposition to the trade union movement, advising that she should not be affiliated with the movement. It was not long until she dis she was discharged and she returned her and she retained her membership in the, the local 1878. That was your local, was it? We didn't we didn't put a number on there. I see. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> wasn't what when the UTW came in? You were part of the UTW. You joined that local also, didn't well, you? Well, yeah, we joined it because it was a union. Right. Mm -hmm. But you see, they come in and took our union away from us, and we got to plan organize, holding our meetings. Then Cox and Dean come in and took it over. Did you continue to be active? Yes, ma'am. Not not with Cox and Dean, no. You see, what, what I think that what happened was that when they went into the, the bigger union, the, the AFL, and then when Cox and Dean called off the strike, told them we should get back, then his, he said, we stood back. I think I'm quoting you. That's what you said a little bit. I think they stood back when they we, came in and brought their new union in. When they, when they brought the new union in, then we, we went right on being a union person. Yeah. But we didn't believe in it because we yeah. knew the history of them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the first time that they ever done that job. Mm -hmm. And we knew what it does. We tried to tell the people. Mm -hmm. But they went ahead and signed up with them. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, the next one is Ruth Van. Ruth Van. Uh -huh. uh, she applied for a job twice and she called off. Uh, she fired only for one reason that she's a member of the union. Jimmy Y uh, W Y O U F F. Jimmy Wyoff. I don't remember that name. Mm -hmm. He was told by Mr. Moody. Charles Moody. He talking yeah. about the dang president in the mill then. Okay. He was See. told by Mr. Moody that he had no chance. Uh, he would have to change some of his plans if he wanted to join to his job back. We're not going to work any more of those radicals. Well, Charles Moody was was a company man then at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But Felix Parson was a personnel manager. Mm -hmm. We all had to face him, not Charles Moody. Mm -hmm. But this is Wyckoff. Uh, yeah. Right. The next person is Minnie Bowen. Minnie Bowen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember her. Now, this is a very strange, a very sad case. How is Alfred White Bowen? Alfred White, Alfred Bowen White. Jimmy Bowen, uh, Minnie Bowen. Yeah, Minnie Bowen. Uh, she applied for a job uh, when the strike was called off, was told she could, quote, go back to work if she'd uh, join the, the, uh, the right uh, employees association. Well, that's when the company set up their own union then. Okay, Dwight, the old uh, Dwight Employee Association. So that, that was put up by the company. Mm -hmm. And so she was told she'd have a job back if she'd find that, and she wouldn't do it. No. The next one is T.E. Abernathy. Yeah, I remember him. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing with him. Then the next is J.P. Holland. J.P. Holland. Uh-huh. Uh, he worked at the Wright Manufacturing Company for about seven years until he was elected president of the local, of local 1878. I believe that, instead of J.P. Holland, I believe that was uh, Clarence Holland. He I was, could be mistaken. Yeah, he was, uh, well, uh, but he was uh, elected in November 30, 1933. As soon as Mr. Holland became president of the local union, the management began to look for excuses as uh, had been done with the previous president of the local, Mr. A. A. Sewell. He had been discharged a yes, few right. days prior to the time Mr. Yeah, Holland yeah, took over. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, and so it just describes how each of these presidents then got fired. Well, if it was ever a public meeting held, or any government agent come into this town, I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. um, um, do you remember when the pre you must remember the presidents of your own local, don't you? Do you remember the local? This local that was set up when the UTW came in. Well, well, let's see. When uh, we had it down there, and me and uh, Walter Pearson, Pearl Bailey, and Mr. Lofton, and a bunch of others, I can't come to it right now. We organized it. Then they came in, and we got it organized. Mm -hmm. Then they sent Cox and Dean in and told the people we could do better than that. You didn't, you didn't have no back or nothing. And the people swarmed over to them. See, when, when did that happen? In the 30s, 30s? November. November? No. November 33. The UTW came in, like it said, as a new president. It was in November 33. Clarence Holland was a... Was a yeah, I, I, Clarence Holland's supposed to be. But John finally... Said the same thing. Holland became president, yes. He replaced uh, Mr. Sewell, but evidently he's saying... Sewell was a good man, and Clarence Holland, I mean, Holland, he's the one that finally took over the Dwight Manufacturing Association. Mm -hmm. Company union, we call uh -huh. it. The uh, company union. So it took over the company No, uh, so Holland, Holland. Holland done it. Now, who was the... That's interesting. Who was the president of your Dixie Federation? Who was the president? Yeah, of, was there a president of yes, your... Yes, we should get that, you're right. Oh, well, uh, Walter Pearson was Walter president. Pearson was a president. Yeah. And when the, when the UTW came in, and it says here, it looks like the UTW came in in November of 1933. Yeah. Um, did, did you all merge, or did you have no, a split? Um, was it split, or yeah. did you all come together? We don't understand what happened exactly. Well, as I said, honey, we, me and Walter Pearson and a bunch of the old hands, we wasn't afraid to, to do it. We took it on our own self. And we got out of here and walked, shook hands, talked to people, till we finally got to go ahead. And when it did, we know the first thing and the only thing to save our hide is to get a bunch of these people that wants to be in the union name on this uh, document. document. Yeah. We got that. Then it wasn't too harsh because we held our meeting. And the company wouldn't jump on us. Mm -hmm. Then they saw what we were doing, and then Cox and Dean come over. I said, okay. And when they come in, they come in telling the people, we ain't got nothing. Well, we didn't have a dime to our name. Fact of it is, a man that helped organize it, old man Pearson, not one of my Pearson, but old man uh, Lofton, he sold his old lady wash pot to get dang him some of the money to help us chart this thing. Mm. That's how desperate we was then. We didn't have no money, but they come in telling us how all good things that they could do for us. Yeah. We'll get you a contract and make it rolly. Mm -hmm. People fell for it. They, we just, all of us old people just stepped back. We didn't attend their meetings. We just stepped back and let the people go wild. Well, then, but, yeah. But you were, you, but you were a part of the strike. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. We, we pick it to bill. But we didn't participate with Cox and Dean because okay. we knew it. Okay. That's okay. See, That's we had done been told. Yeah, I see. So now, with so a lot of these folks that they're mentioning seem to be officials in the local 17, 1778? 1078? Uh, the, the, the Holland. In the UTW local. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they aren't the same people that were in your union. No, they, they're different. They, see, they come in. And we got beat on the track, had to go back to work. Then the company organized what they call Dwight Manufacturing Company's Employees Association. Now they organized that after the 34th strike. Yeah. Right. And then we come at, they come at the meeting up here in the, in the, on the company property. And they call it the Company Corporation. 1878. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was there a lot of opposition in joining this company's association? I never did join it. I didn't join it. Did they expect you to? Yes, they expected us to, but we didn't do it. I never signed the card with them. Why do you think you did not get? How do you think? You, why do you think you got your job back? They needed 
skilled dogs in the spinning room. That's the biggest one of the biggest department yeah. I was. I was a good dogger. Mm -hmm. But of course they had it in for me because I was in the strack and they yeah. knew it. See, we had done Penn and Bennett Punishment Company and they knew it would organize them at the time and we had to close down when Cox and Dean come in. Yeah. We done holding our public meetings mm -hmm. because we knew our rights. Mm -hmm. And when we got to people, as I said, meeting down here with us, and they come at, going out, mm -hmm. then when Cox and Dean come in, they say push us back while we just fell back. And we told the people. You better watch out, you're going to get it. But of course, when they struck, they all stayed out with them. Mm -hmm. They didn't give us one red penny for nothing. Mm -hmm. They didn't say, you need any groceries, or your children need any milk, for nothing. Mm -hmm. And if I live to be a thousand years, I'll never, never forget Cox and Dean standing right up before me and telling us poor workers, we've done all we can do now. You get back the best damn way you can get back. That was the very words he told us. Then, as I said, we had to go up there at the company. Mm -hmm. We lined up. Of course, the company selected a few of their their people, you know. Mm -hmm. First, went in there and got the mill sort of shaped to start. Mm -hmm. Then we had to go up there and line up. He went in there. They had the spinning room ball with Bill Ackley's, Parson, and uh, old man Thompson, and a bunch of them, overseers. If we go through, they said, where are you from? Spinning room. Being like, get out, cops. Out the door I went. He'd done a lots of them. Lots of them never did. Joe Hale never did get to go back. They barred him from everywhere in the South. He couldn't go nowhere in the South and get a job. Who is that now? Joe Hale. Joe. Oh, yeah. So that's, Joe that's, Hale. Yeah. He was barred and blackballed and mm -hmm. throwed him out of, out of his home. Where did he go? He got him a house somewhere else. He stayed around this town for a while. I don't know. Joe died, though. But little Joe, man, a little bit he thought about my side, about my height, but he wasn't bigger than I am. They called him the loudmouth, Joe Hill. Why did they call him the loudmouth? Because he, he didn't give a dang what he said, honey, in there, who he said in front of him. He was that much union. And the company knew he was union. The company knew I was union. Walter Pearson, I don't believe, ever got to go back. Now, here's another. Well, there's, uh, let's see, R. Holland. Uh, then there's Alexandra G. Aldridge. That was the one that Cox and Dean set up in there. Yeah. Now, here's another one. What, what, what did they do to Alexandra? Who? You're talking about Alexandra, right? Uh, the Cox and Dean, when they come in to set up the union to negotiate. They're the ones that select these people to spread them and buy stuff like that. If it ever vote held out on it. Now, the, here's a, a woman named Louise Walker. Louise Walker. Applied for a job when strike was called off. Refused to say, Maria say. Uh, made second application. Then it says, this young girl told of another, of another type of intolerance that the management of the Dwight Management Company, company allowed to go on in their plan uh, of how Willie Davidson made very uncivil proposals to the girls in the mill. Willie Davidson? Mm -hmm. That happened to be Wiley Davidson. Wiley. W-I-L-E-Y. Yeah. Wiley. He was a dang man in the, in the weed shop. Mm -hmm. And he walked up to a woman. Now, I'm not saying that's me yeah. now. He walked up to a woman. She wouldn't go with him. Well, that's what she's accusing him that's of. That's exactly him. So you say that's that That's exactly true. It. That's true. Okay. Let me describe it here. She says, uh, we would make very uncivil proposals to the girls in the mill. If the girls would go out, in quotes, with him, then they could hold their jobs much easier. Miss Walker was one whom he made, uh, to whom he made such a proposal, and the management is fully aware of the fact that this is going on. It was so nasty we did not bring it all into the hearing, but it is a well-known fact that many cases of this kind exist and that the management is aware of it. Some of those cases have been aired in the local courts, and yet the Dwight Company continues to employ such men 
who care nothing for humanity, it seems. Surely, in fact, the board should realize that such a management, with such a management, that cares no more than this for the employees that work for them, than to keep brutish men as overseers. Wiley Davidson was overseer over the weed shop. Yeah, okay. And just like I think what he did, all the folks that did, I believe he got one boy living now, if I'm not mistaken, he may be dead. But his wife's gone, he's gone now. But he was just out of way, he lived down here on the corner below me. Now, was that common? Sure. Okay. Did they talk about, did, was there any sense that if the union came in, that that would change? If the union came in, they know good and well what they had to do. We would be forced to cut all this stuff out. Honey, I, I, I'm on record, but I can't, got no wild body to prove it now. But back in 1900 and, uh, 1907, 1908, 1909, my folk come to this town in 1909. And my sister, two of my sisters, two of my brothers, three, all three of my brothers, went to work up here in the mill along with Papa. See, at that time, he didn't, he was out looking for help. They come from up in Jackson County, sent a judge up there by the old man, Judge Hurts. And he drove a buggy from here, to Stevenson, Alabama, up in there hunting people to work in the mill. And he come by my, well, my father's home when he was living up there. And says, now, if you and your, bring your family, say, we'll set you up in a house. You furnish it and get your drawers and everything because we need your help. Well, my father and them took his word. So they even give him transportation fees. Papa had to sell everything he had except the clothes he wore on his back and all. Load up the children and my Lizzie, Faye, Lee, Will, Tom, and Hollis, six of them, all went to Huntsville. And they went out to Hobbs Island, got on the steamboat. And they come up the river, up, up, to, up to Gunnerville on the steamboat. They got off in Gunnerville, and they caught this little old train to run from Gad to uh, Gunnerville. Mm -hmm. Rode down here, and this old, this, this old wide end, I wish you could get to that place up there. Honey, if you don't mind, when you go back, on the boat, and when they brought them in, they didn't have the house ready. They put them up here in the hotel, the old Glad Hotel. It used to be where them, uh, that flower shop is up here on the corner. Yeah. The hotel used to sit right there, it burnt down. Hmm. They put them all up there in the hotel. And they got the house built, then they moved my folks out into the house. And then my brother, I mean my father, three of my brothers, Three months sisters went to work in the mill. Hmm. And then you were born too. I was so. born in 12. Yeah. See, they come in and said, I was born in 12. So you were born in this village and lived here all your life? Born right down on Second North. And I've been in the mill village ever since then. Of course, when I married, I was living over on Hinsdale. Mm -hmm. And of course, we. wasn't doing no good then back in the day in 1936, you know, depression is full on us and all. So, so did you, what did you make in the mill then? About eight or nine dollars a week. You see, that's the thing that once the, once the, they went back, then the companies didn't live up to the NRA code. Well, they stretched us out. Yeah, they stretched, yeah. Stretched us out and cut wages. Yeah. And I said, I have dogs up there, 11 hours, 45 minutes a night, mm -hmm. for seven and eight dollars a week, yeah. 12 hours a night. So they, and that's, that's a very important thing that we get that documented, that, that 
Once they went back, yeah. Now, do you think there's any chance that we could find uh, Louise Walker? I believe she did, sir. I, I wouldn't yeah. be for yeah. But you see, back in them days, now Clyde Ware is living. You got his phone number? I do. You have? Clyde was with us all the way. Now, here's some other people. Viola McKibben. McKibben. J.T. Walden. Yeah. Any of them alive? Nope, all dead. George Seals. No, he passed away here yeah. three or four years ago. E.E. Uh, e. Ballard. E.E. E. Ballard. Yeah, well, he worked for 20 years then, so he's bound to be gone now. Hey. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We had the old man Ballard who used to live down here. I don't know what his boy's name is. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was a deputy sheriff. He's still living because I talked to him down here. Now, I know it ain't the old man Ballard because the old man Ballard died a long time ago. This is his son that I'm talking about now. He's about my age. Yeah, well, that might be that. No, well, he he been working 20 years, so that wouldn't be that. And he worked in the mill. His son worked in the mill, too? Ballard, yeah, yeah. Little, little Ballard worked up right, too. You might get his um, uh, yeah. name then. Uh, H. C. Busby. He did. Mm -hmm. That was a good man. He was. He was one of the one to help us form our union. Mm -hmm. What did he do? Huh? How did he do that? We talked by mouth. See, we organized it, but just by talking. Until we got the strength, and then we went and come to having the meetings. Mr. Uh, Willie Davison, Mr. Busby's overseer, told him before the strike that, quote, next time he, Mr. Davison, heard Mr. Busby fooling with that union, then he should kick him, kick him out. That was Wiley Davison. Yeah. And then uh, Busby, uh, he worked in the wee shop. I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you hear threats like this? While you, did anyone threaten you? Did you hear this kind of stuff? I didn't know to hear it. I saw it. Could you tell us about it? I mean, it's one thing to read on paper. Maybe you could describe some of this to us. Well, I know I'm not going to some of the facts there because I've got no way to, you know, prove it. I want to just buy what I got in my head. But I saw things in that mill. It shouldn't have been happening to nobody. As I started to tell you a while ago about my sister when they went to work. Back in them days, you got if you were working in the wee shop or cloth room or wherever you worked, they stayed on you day and night. My sister got so mad at the boss of my brother who worked upstairs. She took a shuttle out of a loom, went upstairs, threatened to beat him to death with it, caught him jumping on my brother. <laughs> That's how rough it was. That's back in the 1909, 1910. So that, how did your family feel about coming out of the country down to the mill village? Well, my father passed away, my mother passed away, and all my brothers passed away except one. I've only got one brother living out of my family on my side. But they, they, he was a dirt farmer up there. One mule, not a two mill farmer. Yeah. One mill farmer. And he noted with a bunch of people he had there, he cropped a little rough and bad. So he took them up anywhere because he knew that he'd get every one of the job, and he they prospered by coming. So he was glad to come. Oh yeah, he was glad to come. Did he have a garden here? Did he do any farming once he got here? No, he went to work in the mill. Of course, he done his farming when he got out of the houses. Now, yeah, yeah he used to raise a garden every year. Mm -hmm. Okay. My mother too. Yeah. So they had a garden as well. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. He had his corn, his tomatoes. Planted it on tobacco, yeah. growed it, dried it, smoked it. Yeah. Take that old leaf tobacco, yeah. roll it up, put it in his pipe, yeah. smoke it. Put a uh, put a wrap it up in, in, in the tin can with an apple to flavor it. Yeah. I'm from North Carolina, and I know how the farmers around there used to cure their own tobacco. Yeah. 
make twists and, and yeah. cut off twists for chews. Yeah. Uh, let's see, the other people here is uh, May Gibson. Uh, Uh, she was, uh, yeah, she was uh, fired. Uh, Annabelle Harrison. D-O-V-I, Dovey Jet. Dovey Jet. Uh-huh. Yeah, I remember her. What do you remember? What happened to her? She, she finally got back to work, but they had the union. We got our union in. She went back to work in the mill. W.G. It's a little short one. I remember well. Let's see then She's still the next. Alive? Oh, I'm, all of them gone. J.P. Holloway. That's uh, uh, J.T. Holloway. Yeah. P. T. I'm mean, sorry. J.P. Holland. Holland. J.T. or J.P. 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 Holland. J.P. Holland Jr. Yeah. Uh. Clarence Holland was his daddy. And uh, Kali Mount, uh, C.M. Brewster, yep. uh, Daniel Musket. I remember him, yeah. Um, described how he was uh, told that if he didn't get out of the Union, they're firing. Uh, Norma Hicks. Norma Hicks, yeah. She she went back to work though, mm -hmm. not at not that time. When she was, I remember Norma when, hey, we got our union set up in. Then they couldn't hold them. See, Margie Holland, Agnes Paris, yep, D. R. Ballander, J. H. Uh, Cornet. G Cornet. C O R E N U T T. Cornet. Cornet. What was the first name? J H. J H. Cornet. Yeah. yeah. None uh, of these people are alive. No, they all. Are. Not even this Holland man, because he's younger. It seems like. J P. Holland. No, I believe J P. is dead. Best um, my memory. Here's another mention of A A Sewell. Getting fired after he became president of the. Union, and then they got a whole bunch of others. Uh, Dwight Boyd, Hoyt Dodd, F. M. Addison. Yeah, F. M. Reno Addison, and yeah. Uh, e. L. Roberts. Yeah. Uh, Otto Buckholder. Otto Buckholder. Any, none of these people around? No, none of them gone. There yeah. were a few of those old people left here. Leslie Underwood? He's gone. He lived, lived right across the back out of me when he died. Bertha Coxwell? She's gone. Uh, Carrie Shanafelt? Carrie Shanafelt, she's gone. Uh, That's Hobson's wife. Fiona Stapleton? Stapleton? Tom Carroll? Tom Lipscomb. Tom Lipscomb, yeah, he, he, he's gone. I remember the name. Charlie Stapleton. Haywood Brothers. Harry Moody, Mooney. Floyd England. Floyd England. Uh, Lucille Stewart. You have an old man Stewart daughter. B.M. Buckner. Carl Ballard, Buna Warren. Buna Warren, yeah. I remember her, she used to live up on Little Street. J.W. Mount. J.W. Albert Templeton. Albert Templeton, he, he used to live right, well, he, he died right up here above me. Lillian Wilson. Wilson. Uh, No. Addis, uh, let's see. Alice, he was re-employed for a few days since strike called off. 
but his overseer came to him and said that Mr. Moody has voted against you, and so you're out of a job. His work was then stretched out. Yeah. Among the very seldom, very seldom. It won't a while. Don't come down. What's it? It won't a while. Don't come down. You know. Uh, yeah. But nobody went in now that plant the whole time we were down. Because I'm gonna tell you, our people had baseball bats. Mm -hmm. Some of them had guns for their own protection. Mm -hmm. Some of them had sticks, mm -hmm. iron bars, mm -hmm. and nobody there. Well, all we done is go down in front of them gates, and it, we take your time about. I'd say pick it from nine to six mm -hmm. till in the morning, six, and then I'd go home. They had another crew come in by us, take it over. And we had uh, one picket down on the uh, lower end of the mill. Mm -hmm. We had one up here, two on the square, and one down here on this one, and one down this end of the mill down here. If they could get in. And we had, uh, at that time, we had to walk in, go in the lower end of the mill. You had to walk a lake bank to get in there. Or you'd come up above the second mill, second uh, lake bank, and go in the mill. But he wasn't, he wasn't much violence. So, no. but you were well armed. Huh? You were well armed. With uh, sticks and baseball bats, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. See, yeah. the company, the company, they couldn't, they couldn't hire nobody. They, they hired somebody, I don't know who it was. Come in one, want to do a little strong arming. Mm -hmm. And I remember, don't remember who it was, but I remember this, they run him out of town. They put him in a car and took him out of town. Now, what did the sheriff do? Didn't you have bell guards that? Uh... Sheriff didn't interfere with us. He did interfere with the Goodyear workers when they mm -hmm. organized. But the sheriff let you keep. Yeah, alone. he left us alone. Mm -hmm. Now, could you have, back to when the calling the strike off, do you think you could have continued the strike if uh, 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 Cox and and Co. didn't tell you to, to uh, go back? No way in the world because our people were starving to death. As I said, they did not give nobody one red penny. So you think they had no choice? But they they, they didn't have no choice. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the Cox and Dean, when they, the only thing that made me mad, I knew they were going to call it. The only thing that made me mad is what they got up and told us. It's over with. We've done all we can do for you and the yeah. people. Now. now go up there and get your job back in the best way you can. And they left. And I ain't seen Cox and Dean since then. Okay, so that, so that you think that there was no choice. We, we didn't have no other, no other choice. Mm -hmm. and then as I said, we tried to line up and get our job back. They just starved you out. They there. starved us out. Okay. Okay. They starved us out of it. Mm -hmm. I had only been married. I'm married in 32. And uh, I had a wife, and she was pregnant with the first young one. No. But we didn't have an alternative. Mm -hmm. But as I said, on the second strike, not a second strike when we pulled them out. That's in 41. Yeah. yeah. We rented a building up here on Tuscaloosa, and we bought our meal, flour, everything by wholesale. The international gave us the money, mm -hmm. but we run our own store. And when we come back over that strike in 46, we decided that we wasn't going to take no change no more. Then we got the union and we drawed up an agreement and everybody signed it. It'd take one quarter a week out of our payday and turn it into a trust fund. And when we pulled them out the last time they come out, but only out 11 days, uh, 11 days, we got machinery set up and all, got draw all our money back in. And we give away $187,000 hmm. to the workers at $25 a week apiece. For the duration of the strike? Yeah, well, the strike was over. Yeah. And what money we had left. That, that they closed down, you see. When the mill closed down. That's right, yes. So they had this strike fund left mm -hmm. over. We had, well, when the mill went down, we had a strike fund, you see, then. But the first time, the international fed us. Second time, why well, we fed our own self, and at the last strike in, in the fifties, when we struck them that time, we had a trust fund already built up to right close in two hundred thousand dollars. Now, during the thirty-four strike, uh, 
uh, what did you do to try to help people get food? Nothing, not what he can do. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you this, and this is, I know it's on the line, but the old man dead and gone. We struck, I believe it was on Wednesday night. That's my remembrance. I was trading with a merchant right down here on, on uh, Lakefront. I won't call his name because he dead and gone, and all of his kids are gone, and his wife too. But I was trading with groceries, and I'd average maybe two or three dollars a week in groceries. Back in them day, you get more than you could haul away in a truck for ten or fifteen dollars. But we wasn't making no money. And I went down there the next day. Ed would come out on the strike and walk in the store. And the old man said, "What do I want? What can I do for you, Barton? I want a pack of bull arm cigarettes. I mean, bull arm tobacco. Yeah. Can't let you have it." I said, "Why?" I said, "You on a strike." I said, you mean tell me I'm on a strike and you won't let me have five cents for it? Nope, won't. I said, all right then. I said, when I draw my panty, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to throw it in the damn door and walk off and leave you. I never did trade no more with that man, but he turned me down for one five cent pack of smokes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody couldn't get nothing nowhere. They had, a, they had a between a rock and a hard spot. Now, do you think the employers had anything to do with that? Sure. They had to have. See, merchants had all been that people were with the companies. Uh -huh. See, they banked on the old wide manufacturing company up here for feed these people over here and the bank run the bids and all. Now, in some places, we've been told the merchants were with the strikers. It didn't happen here. No, sir. As I said, I got turned down for a five cent pack of yeah. smoking tobacco. Okay. Hmm. And I went and drove my last payday out of the mill. See, they held back a week on us, a week and three days. So they paid us off. Hmm. I went down there and I paid him. Well, now, what can I give you? Not a thing in the world. I don't want nothing you got in the store. And I went off. Well, when that was spent, where I left, no house rent, because the company told us that you won't pay no rent until you go back to work. Then you go back to work, you back up, pay your old rent back, yeah. which we did. And uh, light bills, one or two or three dollars a month back in the days. And some people, you know, they shut the banks down, you know, during the Depression. Sure. That tied up a lot of the people's money. Yeah. They haven't had a little money, but they didn't want to spend it. Yeah. But it was pitiful going through that 34. Now, what was life like in the mill village? Did the employers pretty well control the, the, the life in the village? Well, back in the day before the union came in, yes, sir. Everything was a company. Mm -hmm. The company owned every house in the village, yeah. which is 755 houses. Mm -hmm. They owned everything. And if they wanted you to move, all they had to do was tell you to move. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to get another house, you had to go up there and see old Felix Parson. And he'd give it to you. Mm -hmm. Now, I was living across the street in that little, right across the street over there. I had my mother, my wife's mother, and my four boys and myself all over in a three-room house. Good God. So this was a four-room house. So Willie Kelly did live here. You mentioned his name a minute ago, Willie Kelly. Yeah. He was the boss up here in the mill. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got him a job, job of Goodyear. So I went up there and told old Felix Parton I wanted that house. He said, I can't give it to you. I said, you can do. Now, if you don't want to do it, so I'm going up there to see Mr. Loner, DJ Loner, Charles Moody. Oh, I'll give it to you. So he Willie moved out morning. I moved in that evening. Forty-four year ago, this summer. And to this house. June, yes, sir. I moved in this house. Uh, yeah. Nineteen and forty-four. My boy was uh, they born in June, and I moved over here. I believe it was September, October. When did you buy the house? I bought it when he sold it. When was that? It's in the 50s. Eddie, we, Eddie, we come back off of that other strike. 
the company told us they go sell the houses. Said them that wants to buy them, and well, can buy them. Them that don't, said we'll sell them, and then you can get the stuff out and all. So I bought the house here. And you know how I got it? Thirty-four hundred dollars all this house a lot cost me in days. And I paid it out at seven percent interest. And that seemed high at the time. Now this house is valued thirty eight thousand dollars. Hmm. See I got five rooms, I've added on another yeah. room here. Yeah. Remodeled the house inside. All except my front bed front bedroom in there has not not been worked on. I just leaving it up for old time's sake because <laughs> behind them ceiling in there, I mean the ceiling in that room is just exactly what I had overhead and everywhere in the whole house. Have you seen beaded ceilings? Yeah, yeah. You might like to see it. You want to tell, you, you could show it to her. Janet, Janet, remember Janet, that's the young woman that you met with um, Eula. Yeah. She mentioned to me that you had told her that at your local union meetings with the um, the meetings that you had with the Dixie Federation. Yeah. That often some sp you knew that there were spies coming to your. Sure, we knew it. Could you talk about that? Oh, honey, they, they come, they, everybody come down there with a potential spy. Only we was out in the open, and they just wouldn't let their shirt tail get to the back before they get a fireman report to come to what we were doing. See, we didn't care. We were wide open, but we didn't care. Why didn't you care? Huh? We were trying to organize that union, and we done it. Company know that we'd organized it. They didn't pick none of us off because they know everything was going on down there by having their people come in. And one of these Hollands is on here. Clarence Holland, I believe it is. He did go. He was one of the main company men that the company set up when they set up the company union. Then. You know a fellow named Marshall Wallace? Yeah. Is he around? He yeah. did and gone. It said, during the strike, uh, Marshall Wallace circulated a petition among the workers asking that the plant reopen. He was chased into a drugstore by a mob with rocks, mm -hmm. one of whom had an open knife. He finally had to get police protection to go home. Now this is the, the thing that the employers uh, submitted, Dwight Manufacturing Company submitted to the government and acts uh, to this thing. You yeah. Well, there wasn't no such thing back in the days as, uh, as uh, what they called it, uh, the law that, uh, where you know you can bring them in on a case now. Yeah. Peel court. Mm -hmm. They didn't have nothing like that then. He dealt directly with, I mean, worse than I reckon. Go to India with us here. And they described the, uh, the employers described the, the way the workers were armed. Uh, approximately fits in broomsticks you without hit the, a baseball bat. You hit in the head on the nail now. Toward the end of the strike, after the Saragotsoda victory mills of Alberville and Gunnersville had been reopened, under the protection of a specially organized police force, and after rumors that the chief of this force was coming to Alabama City to open the Dwight plan, many of the strikers were armed during the night with shotguns, pistols, and rifles, and stacks of such firearms and ammunition were kept in, in nearby places of concealment. Do you remember that when they what, said that this force was going to come in? They, we had been threatened. Yeah. But they never did come. They never did come. But we do know, to be the fact, mm -hmm. that the company bought every one of their men damn pistols. Mm -hmm. And forced it. They, they had pistols on them. We didn't. Mm -hmm. Baseball bats. You say you didn't have guns. No, I didn't have no gun. Uh, it wasn't a gun carrier. When the strike commenced, a few workers who went into the plant 
the objects are working met with minor violence on going in. And then they said there's nothing after that. Who did they hire to uh, use these guns? Yeah, they, 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 all the bosses had guns. Every boss in that mill had a pistol. was bought by the company. And if you go check the sheriff's record over in town, you'll find out that every one of them was armed. Now the man in armed, old Bob Lee, he's dead and gone. He didn't want to help break up, let the union, let that uh, bunch of thugs take them union people out over on the courthouse steps and beat them organizers to death, my dear. When he was a when it organized in Goodyear. Old Bob Leith. Sheriff Leach. So the, the president of the court I had to go back to Compton D. Yeah. They were handing out the orders. I see. What could be done and what couldn't I be see. done. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as we mm -hmm. We every time a train and blow the whistle, and we know he coming in the mill. We go up there and sit down. Maybe five hundred sit down on the darn tracks. Yeah. They would not run over because they're union people themselves, mm -hmm. and they know it. Only thing he took out the mill up there was some orders that they had already packed and ready to go, sealed and everything. Nobody didn't go in and load nothing. But we, uh, I said we, the union at that time, under the Cox and D now. Let the train in, I believe it once or twice, to pull out some old railroad empty cars, and uh, I believe it two cars of clothes went out. Did they continue to organize and pull people, get get people to join them to stand outside on the picket lines during the strike? I mean, did the organization process keep on going? Were there speeches at the picket lines? What was happening? We didn't have no meetings. We, we, everybody went to the picket line for the time we was out. And the only two meetings I knew, can remember, best of my remembrance, was the one when he called us out and the one when he told us to go back. Now, Cox and Dean would come up there every once in a while and go from one place to another, but they were mostly out of town all the time. They didn't stay in there with us. So were there local leaders who took over, you know, organizing the picket line and making sure everything went? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Did you do that? Yeah, I, I didn't do it. I was on the picket line, though. But we had a certain group that'd go to each gate and set our picket time up. And as I said, we had axe handles and uh, broomsticks and boards and jack handles, stuff like that. But I never seen a gun where I was picking in that town, I didn't. I didn't go to every one of the pick places. I didn't see a gun where I was at. This is what they said during the strike. The house of one George uh, Sessler was located quite near a gate where anywhere from a hundred pickets up were maintained constantly. It was vandalized. The charred remains of a door from his house was found in the ashes of a fire kept by the picketers at the gate. The picketers kept a stack of some 18 guns under the porch of this house during the strike. Sessler left soon after the strike was called and returned only after it was over. S-E-S-S-L-E-R. You don't remember Sessler. that? Sessler. Uh -huh. No. Sessler. The closest house, he told me about it, it had to have been down here in Kennebury, like Oak Street. And I would pick you down at the old Oak Street gate. That's where I would pick the put on the line and stayed on it. But I, I never seen a gun on the line. Now, if anybody had any guns, they sure didn't bring them down on the line because we wouldn't line. Did you, did you, did, were you reading the newspapers at the time? Did you, were you aware of, you know, that this was a national strike all over the country? Oh, no. Because the gas and time wouldn't print nothing for us. Well, now here's, here's the get into that. On Saturday, September the 22nd, 1934, 20 copies of the local newspaper carrying the statement of Francis Gorman, Vice President of the United Textile Workers of America, were distributed among the union men at each gate where pickets were maintained around 3 or 4 in the afternoon, this having been the practice of the newspaper throughout the strike. That night, the complainant, local, at a meeting and decided not to call off the strike. 
on account of the refusal of the respondent's manager to see a, co a committee. A te telegram from Mr. Gorman calling off the strike was received by the union local at least as early as the morning of Sunday, September the 23rd, 1934. On Sunday night, September the 23rd, the union local had another meeting attend attended by a state organizer of the United Textile Workers of America at which a vote was taken on the question of calling off the strike and then and the unanimous vote was to continue the strike. The respondent obtained an injunction against picketing, among other things, from the state court having jurisdiction over the matter, and this writ of injunction was served by the sheriff on a number of the leading picketers on the morning of Monday, September the 24th, 1934, beginning at 3 a.m. and ending at 8.30 a.m. Sometime after the first picketers were served with this war writ, the local union had another meeting and voted to call the strike off. So it meant that you resisted what Gorman said to do until they started pulling these writs on you, according to this. I, I wasn't at, uh, I wasn't at one of their meetings, uh, but the meeting when the cock called it off. I remember it very well because I was standing right down there and heard every word he said. He told us that they had done all they could do for us. They couldn't do no more. And for us to go back up there and get our job any way in the world we could. Okay, now here's, here's the employer saying that all listing all the people they fired. They list most of the people we've been talking about. Yeah. They say, uh, replaced by former employee from another job, Ruth Van, J.F. Kelton, D.V. Barfield, C.R. Holland, Alexander G. Aldrich, George Seals, E.E. E. Ballard, H.C. Busby, Charles Billingsley, these are just the ones we've been talking about. And this is the company's presentation, you see. M.C. Brewster, C.H. Carnett, Agnes Parrish, uh, Mansell, M-A-N-C-I-L, McCleary, D.R. Ballinger, Harvey McCleary, R.A. P-Y-L-A-N-T, Pliant, Edna Cannon, W.P. Harrison, Who, Ed, Ed or? Edna, Edna Cannon. Cannon? Yep. How do you spell her last name? C-A-N-N-O-N. H.P. Mm -hmm. Harrison, DeWitt Boyd, E.L. Roberts. Whit Boyd, is that Boyd Whit? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, E.L. Roberts. Yep. Bessie Underwood, yep. Charles Stapleton, Floyd England, Carl Ballard, as a fellow who uh, they say they fired, uh, Una Warren, J.W. Mount, Albert Templeton, Ed Heath, Z.W. Robershaw, Plumer Riley, Maud Inman, M.C. Bowen, Hoyt Williams, Lloyd Cook, Collie Mount, Hoyt Dodd, Otto Burkhalter, Burkhalter, Burkhalter yes, Burkhalter. Henry Baggett, J. M. Seals, Monroe Seals, yeah. Lola Wright, uh, Cleve Spearman, they, that they uh, got these injunctions out against. Them. So, how long did you, did you? Were you at that meeting when everyone decided that they didn't want to end the strike? Yeah. You remember that? What, did the, the two leaders got up and announced the strike's over and everyone got angry? Yeah. Could you describe it a little more? Well, there wasn't nothing we could do about it. And just like I said, it called all of us together right down here in Canterbury. 
hole behind him building down at Kennybury. And he went around and climbed up on the roof of a toilet and stood up on the roof. And all that field back down there behind, of course, the house is built there now. That was nothing but fields right close to that back gate. And they got up there and told us that they'd gone as far as they could done, done all they could do for us. Now then, it was ordered to go back to work the best way you can. That's the words. So, yeah. But it, it sounds like you all, even though people knew that it was going to be tough, they really wanted to try and stick it out. Well, we stuck it out up there. Nobody went in, nobody went out. See, this is what Janet, remember, this is why Janet, I think, in her conclusions, saying that, that they called off the strike when they shouldn't have. And you're saying, though, that they got to because they'd starved it. Well, I wouldn't say everybody starved. I didn't miss a meal. Mm -hmm. Of course, I had some friends that but had a little money. But, but you don't think that they could hold off? Any? No. Okay. Of course, our people would have had you see, Nobody had no money they for life. They were brave, but they had to. Yeah. It was it, it, it just they were keeping us out there. And if it even offered us something to eat, it would have been different. True. But we wasn't offered nothing. Now, when you went back to get your job, what did they say to you? I lined up out there. Went and got in line, walked through. I went in the Felix Parsons office door, walked around there, and Bill Lacalees. All the overseer, we shop overseers out there, they all standing there. And the last drum was standing there. They knew it out of the hard headed union. So I walked in, and the drum told Bill, said, Don't hurry. Him. Bill, I could easily get out, cock, go. I left. Walked out. And either, I don't know, two or three weeks, two or three weeks, something like that. I went back up there and they're still trying to get in. And I went up there and must have caught it at the right time. Because it's all free. They, was, they examined it. They had the nurses in there examining anybody. You get able to walk or crawl or anything, they'd take you. They got desperate. They got some new orders. They got some new orders. They got desperate. And they didn't want to start that thing up full. Okay. So I walked in. You come in in the morning, they'd have clocked at 7 o'clock on the first shift. First shift. Though. First so shift. That was a special. I shift. got a promotion from a third shift to the first shift. Now, now how did did I, and once you got back to work, did they ever talk? Did they ever threaten you or mention? How did people treat you, having known that you were a leader in the union? Everybody, everybody loved the union here, Trevor. But uh, the reason is a little stubborn. When it's last time. And what happened to them the first time? See, hey, we got the organization started, holding their open meetings, charged, I mean, formed their own constitution and bylaws. Then Cox Dean come in, stuck it over. They told them that they, they could handle it better than we could. We didn't have no money, which we didn't. No you saying that we did, we didn't. And just like I told you, just one man sold his wife a wash pot for a dollar and a quarter to help get up the money and pay for the charge. It just that they were that desperate then. So I think we Yeah. Do we would we um 